Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Today's episode involves sexual assault, so I would like to emphasize listener discretion. A decade before Canadian married couple Paul Bernardo and Carla Holmoka shocked the world with their depraved crimes, Alvin and Judith Neely went on a remarkably similar spree, crossing three southern states. Both couples worked as a team to kidnap, sexually assault, torture, and murder. And when they were caught, they turned against each other. The trials of Bernardo and Holmoka are legendary, with Carla's plea bargain being dubbed the deal with the devil by the Canadian press. But the sadistic Neelys didn't garner the same attention in the United States. For one, they were not an attractive couple like the Canadian Ken and Barbie killers. And they also didn't choose victims that the media would be captivated by. One was a 13-year-old girl who lived in a children's home, a victim of abject poverty and sexual abuse before she even met the Neelys. Like Carla, the defense tried desperately to paint Judith Neely as an abused and unwilling accomplice. Also like Carla, no one believed her. But Judith hadn't made a deal before she confessed. Alvin was the one who got the deal. So at 18 years old, Judith became the youngest woman sentenced to death in the U.S. in 1983. Welcome to Episode 60, Boney and Claude, Alvin and Judith Neely. Alvin and Judith Neely were from different areas and committed crimes in Tennessee, Alabama, and Georgia. Normally, I would give you the history of the town, county, or even state to give you a feel for where the victims or killers lived. That's not really possible in a case like this, but I will give you short descriptions of those places as the story progresses. Alvin Howard Neely Jr. was born in Tryon, Georgia in July of 1953. Tryon is a small town of less than 1,800 people, located in Chattooga County, the northwest corner of the state, dotted by hills and pine forests. Tryon's claim to fame as being the denim capital of the world because of the Mount Vernon manufacturing plant that employs some 4,000 people from all over Chattooga County. But the Tryon Cotton Mill was established there in the 1840s, and the small town was fairly prosperous. Growing up in the 50s and 60s, Alvin Neely didn't come from a rich family, but it was a happy family. He was the youngest of three children, the pet, according to author Thomas H. Cook, who described him as a jokester with a charming smile, a disarming smile he would keep his whole life. His childhood was spent hunting, fishing, swimming, going to Boy Scouts, and church. Not the usual upbringing for what Alvin Neely Jr. would become. Judith Ann Adams was born in Murfreesboro, Tennessee less than an hour from Nashville and Rutherford County. I've seen Murfreesboro described as a seedy trailer park town in June of 1964 when Judith was born, but that's not exactly accurate. Not that the town didn't have its share of trailer parks and honky-tonks, but it wasn't quite as dismal as often portrayed in any bio you read about Judith Neely. By 1965, Middle Tennessee State University had been established in Murfreesboro, and the economy had already felt a boost after World War II. Today, it's often called a suburb of Nashville, with people choosing to live and raise children in Murfreesboro, but commute to Nashville, where the cost of living has skyrocketed in the last couple of decades. Judith grew up in the Walter Hill area of Murfreesboro, more rural then and now. Her father was a construction worker and part-time carpenter, and her mother was a housewife. One of five kids, she had an older brother and sister and two younger brothers. When she was nine years old, her father died in a motorcycle accident. He had been drinking and hit a guardrail. It's said that his death had quite an effect on Judith, who was always considered a quiet child. After his death, her mother changed. Barbara Adams put a trailer on the eight acres of land her husband had left her and took a factory job. She struggled, as would be expected, but she also soon took up with a teenage boy. Judith found out when her mother and the boy were in a car accident and she was outraged. They had been drinking, and Barbara Adams was charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Soon, Barbara began seeing many men. She had a CB radio installed in the trailer and went by the handle Indian Princess. 
Strange men started showing up at the trailer at all times. There is no evidence that Judith was abused by any of these men. In fact, according to her and Alvin, she was a virgin when they met. But there was a simple sheet hanging to separate her room from her mother's, and she became very bitter about her mother's active sex life. In 1979, when Judith was 15 years old, she met 26-year-old Alvin Neely when he came to her trailer with another man, answering a CB call from Indian Princess. Judith was no beauty. She had very pronounced buck teeth, and she was as big-boned as she was tall. She stood 5 foot 10 inches. But Alvin thought she was statuesque, like a model, and he loved her long black hair. The two talked until four in the morning, and within days, they were spending every spare moment together. They traded sad stories. Judith told him all about her dad and problems with her mother. Alvin's worst problem was his rejection from the Navy. It was his lifelong dream, but his application was rejected because they found a heart murmur. When he was 17, he began stealing cars. He served a two-year stint once a judge finally tried him as an adult. Alvin and Judith were obsessed with each other, but Alvin finally had to admit the truth. He was already married to a woman named Joanne. He said she was a liar and a cheat and told Judith the marriage was over. Judith wasn't phased by this revelation. She was in love. By the beginning of her sophomore year in high school, she left a nasty note for her mother and eloped with Alvin. I'm going to pause now for a commercial break. Alvin and Judith didn't actually marry right away, but hit the road. For a while, they stayed with his family and then moved to Rome, Georgia, where Alvin started working in a convenience store. A few weeks later, some deposits went missing, and so did the couple. They moved on to North Alabama and then back to Georgia. This nomadic lifestyle defined their lives. Only they quickly learned that no matter how hot they were for each other, having no money put a damper on everything. They would get jobs at convenience stores or markets, only to move on when the cash from the till would go missing. They actually married on July 14, 1980, after Judith turned 16, and they kept traveling, from Texas back to Florida, stopping to stay with relatives, forging money orders to get by. They were enjoying their crime spree, and started calling each other Boney and Claude, a spoof on the infamous Bonnie and Clyde. Alvin had blown up on a diet of fast food and sweets common for travel. He still had his boyish smile, but much of the charm was lost. But Judith lost weight, becoming noticeably thin, a characteristic witnesses would remember as well as her buck teeth. But the good times finally came to an end, however briefly, when Judith was arrested for robbing a woman at gunpoint at the Riverbend Mall in Rome, Georgia. Judith was eight months pregnant with twins at the time. Alvin was picked up with her and sentenced to five years in a Lafayette prison. Judith was sent to the Rome Youth Detention Center because she was underage, and it was there that she gave birth to their twins, Jeremy and April. The couple had always exchanged love notes, but their letters in prison and youth detention were voluminous. It took a detective a couple of days to read through all of them once the couple were caught for their more serious crimes. They were lovey letters that turned jealous as the years went by. Judith got out of youth detention in November 1981 and moved in with Alvin's parents who had taken the twins. Just a week later, she was arrested for robbing an Exxon station, but was back out of jail by March 1982, just in time for Alvin's early release from prison in April of 1982. They had a lovely reunion, but it didn't last long. Reportedly, Alvin told her he didn't want her sexually anymore, but they stayed together, committing petty crimes. They broke into post office boxes and cashed checks and kept forging money orders. On September 10, 1982, a Rome Youth Detention Center employee, Ken Dooley's home, was shot through four times. The following day, fellow employee Linda Adair's home was firebombed with a Molotov cocktail. The day before Ken Dooley's home had been shot, he had received a call from a woman claiming to be a friend of his wife's coming through town and wanted to know their address. He didn't think anything of it when he gave it to her. The next day, his wife got a call, but Ken was out. When he got home, she told him a girl had called 
and thought she was from the detention center. She wanted to know if Ken was home, and his wife said no, but he would be soon. Not long after Ken came in, the phone rang again. It was the same woman. Mrs. Dooley put Ken on the phone, but instead of a woman, a man's voice said, quote, You've screwed the last girl you're going to screw, and you're going to pay. Dooley was briefly shocked, but because of his job at the detention center, he wasn't as alarmed as some might be. He figured it was a prank call set up by one of the girls. Less than an hour later, someone fired four shots at his house and then sped off into the night. The next evening, Linda Adair and her husband were getting ready for bed and also got a phone call. Her husband answered and a woman asked to speak to his wife. When she got to the phone, no one was there. Her husband said the woman sounded young, but Linda just shrugged it off and hung up the phone. At almost the exact same time, her phone rang again and someone started banging hard on her back door. She looked up to see her carport in flames from the window. It was her neighbor on the phone screaming that her house was on fire. The young man at the door had just been passing by, dropping off his date for the evening, and had witnessed someone throw the Molotov cocktail. He was able to describe the car and said it was a couple inside, though he didn't get a good look at them. The crude bomb was made from gasoline in a grape soda bottle and hadn't done much damage. It never made it past the carport. As investigators were still on the scene, the phone rang again. Linda answered, and it was a woman's voice she didn't recognize. She said, I'm calling about the shooting at Ken Dooley's house last night and the attempted firebombing of your house tonight, and you will both die before the night is over. Then at almost 2 a.m., with investigators still at the Adair home, a woman called the Floyd County Police Department. She said she was calling in reference to the shooting at Ken Dooley's house and the firebombing of Linda Adair's home. When the officer answered, yes, she said, quote, uh, for the sex abuse I went through at the YDC. The officer said, okay, what kind of abuse did you take? She said, sex abuse. And for the abuse I took, they are both going to die. And who knows, it might be tonight. And then she hung up. The YDC stands for Youth Detention Center. Then on the evening of September 29, 1982, a call came into the Rome Police Department. The caller said, quote, uh, yes, y'all looking for Lisa Ann Milliken on run from the Harps home? The officer who answered said, Lisa Ann who? The woman said, Milliken, I can tell you where she is. He calmly answered, where's she at? The woman said, go up to Little River Canyon in Alabama. Just as you cross the bridge, turn to the left, go up into the National Park, you'll see on the left some picnic tables in a big rock parking area and look off the side of the canyon where there is a power line going across it. Look straight down the canyon, and you'll find her where I left her. And then she hung up. Despite the other recent anonymous calls involving the youth detention center, the Rome police didn't immediately make the connection. They also thought it could be a prank. Rome lies in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in Floyd County, Georgia, and it's about 20 miles from Cedartown, where a home for girls called Harp's Home was located. It wasn't for delinquents, but rather for indigent girls. Lisa Ann Milliken lived there. Though I've seen it referred to in older papers as a home for troubled girls, it was more like a foster home at the time. Today it is called the Murphy Harps Children's Center, and it offers treatment and counseling for at-risk youth, abused, and neglected children and teens. The officer who had taken the strange call then called the Harps home and found out Lisa had been missing for four days. They thought she was a runaway and hoped she would return. It wasn't uncommon at Harpst. Many girls missed their families but would often return. Lisa was originally from Lafayette, Georgia, a small town in Walker County in the middle of the state, and she had voiced her unhappiness at the Harpst home and talked of wanting to return home to her family in Lafayette. The officer called Walker County to see if Lisa had been picked up there. She had not. Cedartown, where Harpst home is located, is a small city in Polk County, Georgia. Cedartown's pop culture claim to fame is a country music song by Waylon Jennings, released in 1971, that is eerily prescient in Lisa Milliken's case. It's a murder ballad called Cedartown, Georgia. He sang, Tonight I'll put her on a train for Georgia. Gonna be a lot of kin folks squalling and a-grieving, cause that Cedartown gal ain't breathing. The mystery caller also called in a tip to a Rome radio station, claiming the Rome police knew a girl had been murdered and that her body was in the Little River Canyon and the police were covering it up. She said the girl had been shot by a juvenile detention officer. 
the radio station took the information straight to police. The Rome police had already called DeKalb County Sheriff's Office in Alabama where the canyon was, and DeKalb reported that they had found no body. The deputies had gone to look, but the canyon is deep and treacherous, and they didn't go very close to the edge when peering over. The canyon had macabre stories that had been told for years. Author Thomas H. Cook said that the locals claimed that Satanists held demonic rites on the canyon floor. A more valid rumor was that there was evidence of crimes, especially murder in the dangerous canyon. It was a good spot to dump something you didn't want found. Soon after the radio station call, the same woman called the DeKalb County Sheriff's Office, making the same claims, but gave a more precise location, telling them to go left on County Road 176 and go about a mile until they found a place where there were power lines down. She again ended the call with, That's where I left her. This call came in at 6.15 p.m., and the deputies were concerned that they better go rush and look again as it was getting dark. That night, by the beam of a flashlight, DeKalb County Sheriff's deputies found the body of 13-year-old Lisa Ann Milliken. It was after 7 p.m. and already dark when the deputies arrived. They had to crawl out and lay on their stomachs to peer into the canyon and first spotted a pair of blue jeans hanging on a limb. They kept looking until they saw Lisa's white checkered blouse with blood on it. She had been shot in the back and lay crumpled over a fallen tree. Investigators brought her body up out of the canyon by rope the next day and found three used syringes among the debris into which she had fallen. The blue jeans they had spotted were women's and covered in blood. They hung on a limb dangling over the precipice where Lisa was found. Because the canyon had so much garbage, authorities couldn't be certain that everything they found was relevant to Lisa's case, but they bagged it all anyway and delivered it to the Alabama Department of Forensic Science in Huntsville in hopes of a lead. Though Lisa was found in DeKalb County, the sheriff's deputies quickly realized by the anonymous calls that she had probably disappeared from Rome. The Harps Home administrator said she had left with a small group of girls to go to a nearby mall in Rome called Riverbend. Remember, the Riverbend Mall was where Judith was first arrested for robbing a woman at gunpoint. Lisa's case was assigned to Detective Ken Kynes, who soon found that her life had been as sad as it was short. She had been removed from her parents' home, along with her three siblings, following allegations of sexual abuse. She had been placed in and removed from four different foster homes and had spent 30 days at the Open Door Home, another youth facility in Rome, before she landed at the Harpst Home in Cedartown. Lisa had been sexually abused by her father and her mother had known about it. She told authorities he had put his hands inside of her, but her mother told her to forget about it and not to worry because, quote, he would be too drunk to screw her. Then her mother took up with a man named Slick Harris, who took an interest in both mother and daughter. He molested Lisa as well. Like many children who are sexually abused, Lisa became promiscuous. She was also angry and acted out. She did poorly in school. She had all the signs of an abuse victim. Girls at Harps said she had a few boyfriends, and evidently she got into many fights with the girls over boys. So she wasn't well-liked at Harps, and she came from a family who acted like she was an acquaintance when they were told of her death. No crying, no concern, no questions. As depressing as these interviews were for the detective, he still found she didn't have any real enemies. Though she was neglected and abused, her family hadn't murdered her. The best leads were the anonymous phone calls. Ironically, had the location of Lisa Milliken's body not been brought to the attention of DeKalb County authorities, she may have remained undiscovered for years. It was an 80-foot drop from the precipice to the floor of the Little River Canyon where Lisa's body was found. The area was densely wooded and used as a garbage dump by locals. A caseworker from the Walker County Department of Family and Children's Services was brought in to listen to the tapes. He had handled Lisa's case file from when she was removed from her home in Lafayette. Detective Kynes sat in while he was listening, and the caseworker picked up on something right away. Y'all looking for Lisa Ann Milliken on run from the Harps home? The caller had said. The phrase on run rather than run away or on the run, is an insider expression, commonly used by people who have been through the juvenile justice system. The caseworker guessed the caller had a juvenile record. As Detective Kynes pursued this lead, the Neelys were still in action. Five days later, on October 3rd, a 22-year-old woman named Diane Bobo 
was walking down Shorter Avenue in Rome because her car had run out of gas. A man in a red car stopped and offered her a ride. She first refused, but he had a small child in his back seat, so she thought he seemed safe. He made awkward conversation, but he did give her change for a phone call so that she could have her husband pick her up. He dropped her off at a phone booth in a deserted parking lot. After she called her husband, she sat down on the curb. She hadn't noticed another car pull into the parking lot, but now she saw a brown Dodge with a CB antenna coming out of the trunk. She looked away, and a few moments later, a woman approached her and asked, Are you Patricia? Diane said, No, I'm not, and told the woman her name. Diane said the woman was tall and very thin and looked like she hadn't bathed or changed clothes in days. She also didn't look like she had slept. The woman said she was just riding around and thought she recognized her, and then asked Diane if she wanted to ride around with her. She said she was lonely. Diane told her no, sorry, her husband was on his way to get her. Diane later reported the woman didn't want to take no for an answer, telling her, I can take you wherever you want to go. But Diane remained firm and the woman finally drove off. Diane's husband arrived and took her to work where she told her co-workers about the strange incident. She had a bad feeling. She later told her landlord the story, but her landlord was also a police officer and insisted she report it, so she did. On the same afternoon of October 4th, a 13-year-old girl named Debbie Smith was walking home from school in her cheerleader uniform. A woman in a brown car pulled up beside her and rolled down her window. She asked, Are you Michelle? Debbie tried to ignore the woman and kept walking, but she persisted. Is your name Michelle? She asked again. Debbie said no, firmly, and kept walking. She saw the woman very well. She thought she was young, maybe 19 or 20, and she was very unkempt, but she noticed her long dark hair and distinctive buck teeth. She kept questioning Debbie, who tried to be polite but kept walking. Then Debbie got near the open door home, the other youth facility in Rome, one that Judith Neely would know. Debbie decided to walk up to the home and go in to get away from the woman. After that, Judith Neely hit the gas and peeled off, and Debbie Smith walked on home. She told her mother what had happened, and Mrs. Smith immediately called the police. Diane Bobo came in just a few hours after the Smiths to give her statement as well. And just down the hall, another man was being questioned. His run-in with Judith Neely had not ended as well. I'm going to pause now to hear a word from today's sponsor, On the same day, October 4th, in the evening hours, a 26-year-old man, unfortunately named John Hancock, and his 22-year-old girlfriend, Janice Chapman, were walking down Shorter Avenue. They were actually considered common-law married at the time, as they had been living together for about a year and a half. When they had met, he had instantly liked the genial young woman. Author Thomas H. Cook said he soon learned that she had a sad history. Janice had been married and divorced and lost custody of her two children. She had very little education and was intellectually disabled. Because of this, she was often taken advantage of. She took rides from strange men who used her for sex and then wouldn't even drive her home. John felt protective of Janice and thought she would be better off living with him than her mother, who did little to protect her disabled daughter. As they walked along the street that night, a woman in a brown Dodge pulled up beside them. She got out of the car and said she was out of town and sort of lonely. She said she was just riding around and hoped they might want to ride with her. Janice was confused but not scared and wanted to go. John was hesitant. He thought the woman looked rough and like she hadn't slept in a while. He told her no and said they were just walking home. The woman immediately said, I'll drive you home. He said, no need, we're three blocks away. But then he looked at Janice, who was smiling broadly. He finally shrugged and said, okay. He didn't think the woman was dangerous. And maybe Janice would enjoy riding around. Janice got in the back seat and he got in the front. Several hours later, after dark, a truck driver in Gordon County, Georgia, saw a man in the middle of the road, waving his arms frantically and staggering. The trucker stopped and the man said, I've been shot. 
The driver got him in the truck and took him to the nearest hospital, where the admitting nurse asked his name, and when he answered John Hancock, the entire emergency room burst out laughing. But the next day, the GBI was called in because of the story John Hancock had told. He had been shot in the back of his right shoulder, but the bullet had been easily removed with no major damage. He was sent home, despite what he told doctors, though they did call it in. The GBI agents questioned John Hancock at his home and didn't really believe his bizarre story. So they passed him over to Detective Kynes, who was interested. John told him he and Janice had been out walking the evening before and accepted a ride from a woman in a brown Dodge. The woman said she was lonely and wanted to talk. And during the ride, she called a man on her CB radio. His handle was Knight Rider. And the woman called herself Lady Sundown. As John and Janice listened, Knight Rider and Lady Sundown made plans over the radio to meet. They met up on a dirt road north of Rome. Knight Rider drove a red car and had two small children with him. They told John to switch cars and ride with him, leaving Janice in the car with Lady Sundown. John felt uneasy, but not really threatened. Alvin had two small kids in the back of his car, and Judith went and gathered them up and put them in her back seat. Janice had already happily moved to the front seat. Both cars started driving aimlessly again, eventually meandering into Alabama and back. John told Alvin, or Knight Rider, that he had to pee, so he radioed Judith and let her know, and they agreed to stop again. John walked away to urinate, but noticed Alvin didn't, even though he had said he needed to as well. Instead, he walked to Judith's car. John could see the two staring at him, and then he overheard Alvin say, quote, If we're going to do it, let's get it over with. And then Judith walked straight towards John, pointing a gun at him. She told him to walk on down the road with his back towards her. After about 300 feet, she told him to head into the woods and then said stop. Then he heard Alvin yell, hurry up and get it over with. John said meekly, can I ask a question? Judith said, hell no, keep your back to me. And then she said, don't worry about your girlfriend, we'll take care of her. And then she shot him in the back, or rather in his shoulder. But he fell to the ground and instinctively played dead. He lay on the ground for a while, scared they would come back before he ran out to the road. After telling Detective Kynes his story, he said he could definitely identify the couple and would be glad to work with a sketch artist. He also was more able to identify the cars Alvin and Judith were driving. He even remembered they had out-of-state license plates, but wasn't sure where. He thought Kentucky or Tennessee. When he was finished, another officer came in to escort John out. As they walked down the hall, Debbie Smith was in another room, listening to the police tape from the anonymous woman who had called in about Lisa Milliken. They wanted to see if she could recognize the voice. John overheard the tape as they walked by and suddenly yelled, That's the damn woman that shot me! Soon, another detective in Floyd County got wind of the anonymous calls. He was investigating the attacks on the Rome Youth Detention Center employees and immediately connected the cases. That Walker County caseworker had already suspected the caller had been a juvenile offender. Detective Kynes requested the records for all girls who had been placed in the YDC from out of state for the last few years. He got back 25 names. The detective spent days finding the women on the list, checking their alibis if they were still in the area, and he finally had the list narrowed down to one name, Judith Ann Neely. He created a photo lineup with her latest mugshot, and other similar-looking women and called John Hancock, Debbie Smith, and Diane Bobo back in. John and Diane thought Judith's picture looked like the woman, but didn't positively ID her. Debbie Smith, however, was certain. Now he had a name, and he began his search. It didn't take long. Judith and Alvin had gone back to Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Judith's hometown. On October 9th, she had been arrested at a motel for passing bad checks. Her husband, Alvin Neely, was arrested a few days later, and Detective Kynes finally got word his suspects were in custody on October 14th. But he now knew for sure that Janice Chapman was dead. She hadn't been with the Neelys when they were arrested. The detective felt sure there was no way they just let her go. Kynes, along with other detectives from Rome and DeKalb County, rushed to Murfreesboro, where they were being held in the Rutherford County Jail. To their surprise, Alvin Neely almost immediately waived his right to remain silent though he did ask for a lawyer, and then gave a long, detailed statement implicating Judith as the mastermind in all of their crimes. 
Given his choice, Detective Kynes chose to interview Alvin and let the other detective take Judith. He would later regret that. Alvin told him that Judith planned and carried out the attacks on the YDA workers and that she had murdered both Lisa Milliken and Janice Chapman. She's a dangerous person, Alvin said, claiming he was scared of her. He then drew a map to the exact location of Janice Chapman's body. Kynes thought Alvin was a fat slob and, quote, a complete wimp. He stepped outside of the room as they waited for Alvin's lawyer to finish his interrogation. He walked past the room where Judith was being questioned and saw how dirty and unkempt she was, and the black circles under her eyes. Then he heard her voice, and it stopped him in his tracks. It was the coldest voice he had ever heard. All while Alvin was supposedly singing like a bird, blaming Judith for everything, of course, and leaving out his own part in the attacks, the repeated rapes of Lisa and Janet. After a bit of hemming and hawing, with Judith repeatedly refusing a lawyer, she finally sighed and answered every question she was asked, calmly and in great detail. She said she attacked the YDC workers because Linda Adair had forced her to have sex with Ken Dooley. Both adamantly denied this happened, and I don't believe it did either. I think she had a grudge against some juvenile detention workers, doing their best at a tough job, but she was not abused there. There is no evidence of that at all besides her claims. She also claimed she was part of a prostitution ring run out of the facility, and those allegations were proven false as well. And then she calmly and coldly recounted the kidnapping and murder of Lisa and Janet. So far, she was leaving out details of the sexual assaults. Judith said she had noticed Lisa Milliken because she looked like Joni Cunningham, a character from the old TV show Happy Days. They were both in a video arcade in the Riverbend Mall in Rome, and Judith had walked up and started talking to the girl. Judith said Lisa had gone willingly with her because she didn't want to return to the Harpst home. This does make sense, given that Lisa had been vocal about not liking it there. That night, they had driven around for hours, with Alvin and Judith's twin toddlers in the back seat before finally checking into a motel. For the next few days, she and Alvin kept Lisa handcuffed to a bed frame. She said it was so Lisa wouldn't run off and get her in trouble. She told the detectives that after a few days, she decided that Lisa had to die. She was now afraid she might go to authorities and tell on her. The detectives already knew from Lisa's autopsy reports what had been done to the girl. But it was chilling to hear Judith Neely calmly say she had decided to get syringes, fill them with liquid Drano and liquid plumber. She said that she had seen somewhere that it was a painless way to die. She got Lisa up and drove her to the edge of the Little River Canyon. As her children slept in the car... Judith walked Lisa over to a tree and told her to lie down. Judith said, I told her I was going to give her a shot to put her to sleep so I could leave and she wouldn't know where I was going. She then injected liquid Drano into the left side of Lisa's neck. But the shot didn't seem to work, so she gave Lisa another injection to the other side of her neck, this time of liquid plumber. But Lisa was still conscious. Judith then tried injecting both of Lisa's arms and then each of her buttocks. She sat there while the little girl cried in pain for a half hour. Judith said Lisa told her that the shots burned and begged her to take her back to the Harpst home, promising she wouldn't tell anyone what had happened to her. Realizing that the injections weren't going to work, or at least not fast enough, Judith forced the girl to get up and walk to the side of the canyon and turn her back to her. As Lisa kept pleading for her life, Judith shot her in the back. But Lisa fell backwards instead of into the canyon, So Judith said she had to go push her over the edge, getting blood on her jeans. She then changed her jeans in the car and threw the bloody jeans over in the canyon too. She also threw the syringes into the canyon. Investigators had found those syringes and already knew they contained Drano and liquid plumber. Judith's story was right on track. She said she then drove to Fort Payne with her kids and rented another motel room, waiting for Alvin to join them. All this time, at least for now, she refused to implicate Alvin in any way. She emphatically told the detectives that he was the only man she ever trusted. She was sporting a black eye, but she insisted that she had gotten into a fight. I should also mention that she was, again, several months pregnant. Her baggy shirt hit her growing belly, but with her otherwise emaciated figure, it wasn't immediately evident. As Judith and Alvin sat in interrogation rooms giving alternate confessions, investigators took the map Alvin had helpfully drawn and went and found Janice Chapman's decomposing body right where Alvin had said it would be. She had been shot once in the back and twice in the chest. After the confessions were taken in Tennessee, 
there were some jurisdictional issues to be worked out with the Neelys. Lisa Milliken had been murdered in Alabama, and Janice Chapman in Georgia. As Alvin led the cops to Janice's body, he was extradited to Georgia, while Judith was sent to Alabama, where she had tortured and murdered Lisa Milliken. In Georgia, Alvin was cooling his hills in the Chattooga County Jail when the GBI stepped in with Rome police and DeKalb County detectives. They were there to take hair and saliva samples. Alvin didn't look so good. He hadn't slept much, and he wasn't as sure of himself as he had been the first time. This time, the cops went in hard. They accused him of raping Lisa Milliken, which he first tried to deny, and then said, well, she was on the pill. But he still denied raping her. When the detectives told him that semen was found in Lisa Milliken's vagina and they would soon be able to match it to him, he got nervous. He then told an outrageous story that Judith had, quote, jerked him off collecting his semen in a Dixie cup. He said his wife was bisexual and she was the one having sex with Lisa. He told the cops she poured the Dixie cup onto Lisa's vagina before she had oral sex with her. It's not that the cops didn't believe it was possible that Judith Neely was a pedophile. But Alvin's story was beyond ridiculous. They told Alvin to stop the bullshit, and he slowly broke down. He still insisted it was all Judith's idea and that she made him have sex with the girl, and that they took turns. His story became even more insane as he claimed the 13-year-old girl had willingly had a threesome with the couple. He ended the story by saying that Judith got up one morning after a couple of days and announced that she and Lisa needed new clothes. She said they were going to Kmart. He decided to take the twins and head to his parents' house, and when Judith met him there, Lisa wasn't with her. He claimed he didn't know what had happened to her, but he never saw her again. Then he told the story about John Hancock and Janice Chapman. His story of how they picked up the couple and then Judith marching John down the road and shooting him matched exactly what John Hancock had told the police. He said afterwards he, Judith, and Janice all checked into a motel with the twins. He claimed that Janice undressed immediately and said, hey, you want to get it on? He said they had sex right there on one bed as the twins lay in the next bed. Then he said Lisa had sex with her. He said the next morning, Judith was loading the car while Janice stood in the doorway, not handcuffed, and saying nothing. Again, he said he left with the twins while Judith took Janice. He said when he met his wife back in Rome, Janice was not with her, and Judith simply said she got rid of her. Alvin then claimed that Judith had kidnapped Lisa and Janice for him, supposedly, because while he was in prison, Judith had sex with black men. Alvin, quite the racist, was enraged, so Judith offered to pick him up some girls to make it up to him. He said he at first questioned his wife, and then she claimed she had done this before. He said she showed him newspaper clippings of unsolved murders in Albany, Columbus, and Chattanooga. He said that Judith did all of this to set him up so that she could control him. Quote, That's the whole thing with Judy. She likes to have control over people. Even after years in prison, he still insisted he did not murder Lisa or Janice. He said Judith had some sort of rage inside of her. Quote, She was always mad, but I could never figure out why. I'm going to pause here for a final commercial break. When it came to charging this sadistic couple, Alabama investigators and prosecutors felt stymied. No matter how hard they tried, Alvin would not cop to the murders and Judith repeatedly exonerated her husband. They knew he hadn't shot John Hancock through John's story. It definitely sounded like he was in on the plan, though. And they had no physical evidence to tie him to the canyon where Lisa was found. The best they could do was leave him in Georgia and let the Georgia justice system deal with him. He could definitely be charged with kidnapping, rape, and various other crimes. But for now, they had to focus on Judith. Her trial was scheduled for March 7, 1983. She had given birth to her third child, a boy, while in jail awaiting trial. Public defender Robert French was chosen to defend Judith, and right from the start, he could not stand her and didn't want the case. But he didn't have much choice. He was a good lawyer, and despite how he felt about his client, he set out to rigorously defend her. He began by seeking youthful offender status for her as she was under 21 years of age. 
but his motion was denied. French then asked that psychological tests be administered to determine her fitness for trial. Judith was found quite fit for trial, with superior intelligence and no tendency towards delusion or suicide. French also arranged for her to have dental work on those buck teeth, which were also terribly chipped, and he bought nice conservative clothing for her to wear at trial. District Attorney Richard Igu had no idea how French planned to defend Judith until jury selection, when the questions French asked seemed to be leading to a battered woman's defense, though that phrase wasn't really in the vernacular at the time. In the majestic DeKalb County courtroom, the same courtroom where To Kill a Mockingbird had been filmed, Judith Ann Neely sat meekly at the defense table, mostly staring at her hands. From his opening statement, Bob French laid every bit of the sadistic crimes at Alvin Neely's feet. Quote, every move, every act, every thought carrying out the perpetration of this heinous event was planned, calculated, and instituted by Alvin Neely. He told the jury Judith's story, beginning with her troubled childhood and adolescence. She had fallen for Alvin at age 15 and had left home to be with him, and within a year, he claimed Alvin was beating her savagely. Judith catered to Alvin's every whim, bathing him, feeding him, and eventually becoming brainwashed. French claimed Judith was Alvin Neely's slave. The first witnesses for the prosecution were Diane Bobo, Debbie Smith, and yet another woman named Suzanne Klontz, who came forward because she was approached at Riverbend Mall the same day that Lisa was kidnapped. All three women positively identified Judith, and they also said she did not appear to have any visible signs of abuse. John Hancock was up next to tell the story of his and Janice's abduction. The DA tried to emphasize that Judith was in control the whole time, but on cross-examination, Bob French had John point out that Alvin was directing her from his car. But on redirect, John admitted to the prosecutor that she did not look upset or nervous. She was the one personally giving him orders, and she was indeed the one who shot him. The first defense witness French called in was Jo Ann Browning, Alvin Neely's first wife. She had been married to Alvin for three years in the mid-70s and was mother to three of his children. She testified that Alvin had beaten her throughout their marriage, even when she was pregnant, and that he had drugged and tried to rape her teenage sister. She claimed she had tried to leave him several times, but then Alvin would threaten their children. He was the one who finally left when he met Judith. The prosecutor, Richard Igu, managed to damage her credibility by pointing out that she had remarried before her divorce from Alvin, saying that made her a bigamist and a liar. She had also estimated that Alvin beat her around 800 times, but Igu pointed out that she had never had a broken bone. Joanne left the witness stand very angry and in tears. I have trouble with this and more detail later about Judith's possible abuse at the hands of Alvin. Not all abusers break bones. Some even actively try not to leave a mark that will show by hitting in places that can be covered up. It is unfair to disbelieve a woman who claims abuse simply because she's never had a broken bone. The next day, Judith Neely took the stand in her own defense. Her appearance and demeanor immediately conflicted with a portrait of a victim. And that was the one thing Bob French tried to explain right away. The jury had watched as Judith laughed easily and chatted at the defense table. So French asked her, how do you handle fear or nervousness? She said, I smile a lot. And she did indeed smile through all of French's questions. She reiterated that she left home at age 15 with Alvin willingly because he had been a very romantic suitor. But then she claimed that Alvin changed and his sexual advances were crude, selfish, and becoming more and more violent. She said she was his servant and claimed that she bathed him, combed his hair, cooked for him, and even tied his shoes when she didn't perform these tasks to his satisfaction. She claimed he taught her robbery and forgery and that he was insanely jealous without cause. Judith claimed she had never been unfaithful, contrary to what Alvin had told police. She also said the made-up stories of abuse she suffered at the Rome Youth Detention Center were Alvin's idea. But there was no real explanation of why he would want to target the YDC when he had never been incarcerated there. Judith also went into excruciating detail about beatings and rapes she suffered. Gradually, she was appearing more sympathetic. On her fourth day of testimony, French asked her about Lisa Milliken's abduction and murder. Judith claimed that Alvin had wanted a virgin, so she found one for him. This does line up some with Alvin's story, although he claims it was her idea to make up for cheating on him. 
She claimed that she took part in the beatings Lisa received because Alvin forced her to. She said she watched as Alvin repeatedly raped the girl, and so did their young children. She also claimed that Alvin was there when she shot Lisa and pushed her into the canyon. Judith said he had chosen the spot and was at her side the whole time. This is a direct contradiction to her own confessions to police. She also claimed that after he was sure Lisa was dead, he masturbated. Then he instructed her to make the anonymous phone calls to the Rome and Fort Payne Police Departments. Judith also admitted to the abduction and murder of Janice Chapman, again claiming Alvin forced her to do it and that she feared for her life. She said that Janice was also handcuffed to a bed frame and that Alvin repeatedly raped her. The DA, Richard Igu, went in hard to counter French's domestic violence defense. He pointed out that though Judith had claimed to have been beaten countless times, she had only suffered two broken fingers and a chipped tooth. Again, only suffered? It's possible to have doubts of whether or not Judith Neely was telling the truth about being abused, but to emphasize that she only suffered small wounds is degrading, insulting, and would be unacceptable in a 2019 courtroom. Igu did get her to admit that she acted alone when she shot Janice Chapman. She said the first shot was because Alvin had ordered her to shoot Janice, but then she shot her twice more because Janice wouldn't stop screaming and Judith was afraid someone would hear. Igu then produced a series of photographs featuring Alvin and Judith posing merrily with various guns and family members. In each, Judith was smiling happily. She countered that Alvin arranged all the photos and ordered her to smile. When Igu asked her about the murder of Lisa Milliken, every time he said why, Judith answered, because Alvin told me to. She claimed the only decisions she made for herself were when to eat and go to the bathroom, that absolutely everything else about her life had been dictated by her husband. On redirect, French set about to convince the jury of Judith's claims by showing pictures of her with bruises. Then Prosecutor Igu called a psychiatrist from the Alabama Department of Mental Health who testified that Judith knew the difference between right and wrong and made the conscious decision to kill Lisa. The doctor also minimized the bruises shown in one photo that Judith claimed came from Alvin swinging a baseball bat. The doctor said she could have gotten that from a pinch. When French cross-examined the doctor, he tried to get him to say that Judith had been brainwashed in an established clinical definition of the term. The doctor refused to agree. He was the last witness for the prosecution, and he had been very damaging to Judith's case. French's closing argument was dramatically Southern. He made reference to the Bible and the Chinese principle of yin and yang, pleading with the jury to live with their Christian witness and allow their feminine side, their love side, to shine through. He compared Alvin to Svengali. Prosecutor Igu was more simple and also more effective. He reminded the jury that a psychiatrist insisted Judith was not brainwashed, and he doubled down on how she could not have suffered the abuse she claimed because she didn't have visible scars. I won't bitch about this again, but I am pointing it out one more time. Quote, Judy planned, carried out, and enjoyed her crimes. Alvin didn't have the nerve, but she did. That was Judy Neely, not Svengali. The jury was given instructions at 4.30 in the afternoon and returned their verdict shortly before 11 a.m. the next morning. Judith Neely was found guilty of the murder and abduction of Lisa Milliken. That afternoon, the prosecution and defense delivered arguments in front of the jury in the sentencing hearing. Later that night, the jury delivered its sentencing recommendation to the judge. By a 10-2 vote, they recommended that Judy be sentenced to life in prison. At the time in Alabama, however, a jury's recommendation in a capital case was only a recommendation, the final decision lying with the judge himself. On April 18, 1983, Judge Randall Cole sentenced Judith Neely to die in Alabama's electric chair. She was 18 years old, the youngest woman in the country to be sentenced to death. A bill was signed into law in Alabama in the spring of 2017, barring this tradition of a judge overruling a jury's recommendation. It is now back in the hands of the jury. But after her first conviction, Judith was anxious to avoid another death sentence and pled guilty to kidnapping in the Chapman Hancock case and also agreed to testify against Alvin. Alvin, afraid of Judith's testimony, pled guilty to kidnapping with bodily harm and intent to murder in the Chapman Hancock case in Georgia. He was sentenced to two life terms. In August of 1984, a woman told Murfreesboro, Tennessee police that she had been abducted two years ago and had recently come across a picture of her abductor in the newspaper. 
The picture was of Judith Neely. The woman went by the street name of Casey, and she was the final victim Judith had picked up right before her arrest. Casey said Judith bragged about her crimes, claiming she had killed a girl in Chattanooga, among others, and that she had newspaper clippings documenting all of this. Casey said Judith talked all night and never once appeared afraid. Judith told her she liked to see the look on people's faces when she pulled a gun on them. It was the next morning, October 9th, that Judith had been arrested for bad checks before the Georgia and Alabama authorities got to her. Casey said that Alvin held her at gunpoint in the bathroom as they took Judith away, and then Alvin let Casey go. This Casey has never been identified, and it's anyone's guess if she knew the details of the Neely's case. The media coverage was mainly local to Alabama. So maybe not. But a lot of what she said backs up Alvin's claims about Judith, and it still leaves the open-ended question of, were there really more victims? As with any capital case, Judith went slowly through the appeals process over the years. But in 1998, Carla Faye Tucker was executed in Texas. Like many on death row, she was a born-again Christian at the time of her death, and Christian fundamentalists strongly opposed her execution because of her religion and because she was a woman. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court denied Judith's final appeal in late 1998. It looked like she would be the first woman to be executed in Alabama in 40 years. Judith had also claimed a Christian conversion. She was very lucky that Alabama's governor at the time, Fob James, was also a Christian fundamentalist. In January of 1999, he commuted her sentence to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But the Alabama Attorney General pointed out that while the governor did have the power to commute sentences, he had no authority to regulate parole, and Judith would be up for parole in the standard 15-year wait after her change in sentencing. In 2003, the Alabama legislature passed a bill specifically aimed at Neely, effectively changing her sentence to life without parole. She filed a lawsuit in 2014 when her 15-year wait ended, and actually won in federal court. A judge ruled the law was unconstitutional, so she has been up for parole a few times, but she's always been denied. Alvin and Judith Neely are dichotomies within themselves. They are both liars, who also tell the truth. They'll tell you what they did, Judith rather matter-of-factly, while Alvin minimizes, but they won't tell you why they did it. They both claim Judith had been sexually abused, but there's not a shred of evidence in her childhood or teen years at Juvie to actually prove this. And yet, she is often seen bruised, and in fact, Alvin's alleged abuse of her was her actual defense. He did date her when she was still a child, impregnating her with twins at 16. She initially and adamantly denied any abuse until her lawyer needed it for a defense. And Alvin always denied it. Alvin claimed he was scared of his wife, and in the same breath claims to have had a consensual threesome with a 13-year-old girl. They both claimed that the other had to have complete control, to the point where the other one was either terrified or a brainwashed slave. Both of them denied that they were sexual sadists, but they both were. So which is it? I think it could be all of it, but I think some of it could also be bullshit. I do believe it's possible Judith Neely was abused. And if she was sexually abused, it happened in her home when she was a very young child. Her early, quiet years. Her angry teen years that turned into violent, late teen years. She does have the markers. I do believe it's possible that Alvin physically abused her. But I also think it's possible that she got into a lot of fights. She told police that. I imagine that they were both violent within their marriage. I believe Alvin when he said it was Judith's idea and why she did it. He had no problem calling himself out as a racist. And this is where she is very like Carla Homoka for me. Carla wasn't a virgin, so she sought virgins for her husband to make up for it. But she liked it just as much as he did. Alvin found Judith when she was a virgin. It seemed to mean a lot to both of them. I believe he was angry at her for cheating on him in prison with black men, making it even worse for a racist like him. But like Canadian Carla Homoka, Judith was also a sadist. She wanted to kidnap and rape those girls. She also wanted to bring girls to her husband to make up for her transgressions. I also believe the Neelys were on some sort of drugs and alcohol. It is speculation, though, because it oddly isn't mentioned at all in this case. But riding around aimlessly at night, 
losing all that weight, looking sleepless. I think at least Judith was on something. Alvin was notably overweight. I'd peg him as more of a drinker. But does it matter whether they lied about parts, whether Judith was abused? Many victims of abuse do not grow up to be sexual sadists and murderers. Two girls are dead. Their families still grieve, and it's possible there are other victims out there as well. No, I think this is a case of two sadists fatefully meeting. Boney and Claude, as they affectionately called themselves, started their crime spree small, check hiding and petty theft before moving to robbery. And then they needed the next buzz, something bigger. And that's when their mutual depravity blossomed. But unlike the Canadian Ken and Barbie killers, Alvin and Judith wanted to get caught. You don't make that many anonymous calls, especially one leading to a body that might never have been found if you don't want to get caught. I suppose they needed the attention and validation for their crimes as much as they needed the depraved rush of terrorizing and torturing girls. To me, they display that particular brand of psychopathy that shows no empathy for others. Alvin Neely died in prison in 2005. Judith comes up for parole every five years. This past time in 2018, she tried to waive her hearing before the parole board, claiming she didn't want to put the families through it all again. She had found God. I hate to be cynical, but most cons eventually do. It makes life easier on the inside whether they are true believers or not. But I'm sorry. Judith Neely can talk about Jesus until the cows come home, but you'll never convince me that she's not a monster. Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Coley Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. Today's case was suggested by listener Robin Bagwell. Don't forget, I will be at the True Crime Podcast Festival this week in Chicago on July 13th. It will be held at the Marriott downtown, right on the Magnificent Mile. This festival is strictly for true crime podcast addicts. 100 of your favorite podcasters will be there for you to meet and scoop up swag. This is a full-day event with several panel discussions, live episodes, and a huge meet-and-greet. I will be a panelist along with Justin from The Generation Y, Josh from True Crime Bullshit, Laura from Crime Writers On, and Jillian from True Crime Obsessed. To purchase last-minute tickets or learn more, go to truecrimepodcastfestival.com or look for it on social media. I hope to see you there. I'm also doing a live show with Alicia and Stacy from the podcast Trashy Divorces, called the Scattered, Covered, and Smothered Tour. It's Southern Fried Trashy Divorces, and we are so excited. It will be in Atlanta on Sunday, August 25th, and the doors open at 5 p.m. Please check social media for more detail, but tickets are already on sale. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe, and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and most podcatchers. If you're interested in supporting the show, please visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com. There you can sign up to be a patron of the show, make a one-time donation, or purchase show merchandise. That's southernfriedtruecrime.com. If you have any case suggestions, please email southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. Sometimes private messages on social media can get lost, so email is best. And please feel free to reach out. I love hearing from you guys. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.